I turn on yeah, 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 it is. I can see it in the camera here. Well, I'll keep talking and you let me know when you can hear me. If I can just take it off and yell. Project. Hmm? Project. Project. <laughs> well, I'll speak up and when it blasts you out, when it kicks in and it blasts you out, let me know. Uh, two months ago, in the American Woodturner, there was an article written by uh, Art Leastman about something that he called lost wood turning. And I guess I'm the kind of person that if I turn two bowls, I get tired of bowls and I want to turn something else. And if I turn three vases, I get tired of that and I want to do something else. And I had never done anything like this, so I decided that I would try it. Uh, it's really not that complicated. It, it worked out fairly well. And I'm going to show you today what is spelled out in this article. We're not going to turn this same object, but we're going to use the same process so you can see how to do it. And I do have a, uh, a handout that, that really goes through it step by step. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt at any time. If you've got questions afterwards, let me know and, and we'll work through it. The top of this? Oh, that, yeah, that, okay. I thought I got a Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's not round. <laughs> so. Were these instructions in the American Woodturner magazine? Um, there's a set of instructions in the, in the wood tur American Woodturner. It's not the same set. Um, and if you belong to the AAW, this is available online. Um, if you don't belong to the AAW, you're welcome to borrow my copy if you want. Uh, if you don't belong to the AAW, you may want to consider joining. I think you can get an electronic membership for something like 38 bucks a year. And it's really, um, it's really one of the best wood turning magazines around. But you get 26 years of, oh. of copies available online with your membership. All you have to do is figure out how to access them. So, uh, in fact, uh, well, no, really, in fact, uh, part within that article, they refer you to uh, another article that was written six or seven years ago, and you can go online and access that article. As Mike indicated, there are 26 years worth of uh, information out there. So it's 38 bucks a year. Sounds like a lot of money, but uh, you, you get a lot of value for that $38. Very, very useful. Yeah. The, the basic premise behind this, it's pretty straightforward. You assume you start with a square blank, and I'm not good at drawing squares, so I did this ahead of time. You assume you're going to turn, and this is, this, is, this is a square spindle looking at it from the end. So it's projecting out of the board. You assume you're going to turn the spindle round. It's just between centers. So all that they've done, the lost wood aspect, is they're sandwiching three pieces of wood together. And when I say they sandwich it, they take... You start with the two halves, or the two pieces, that you want to be your final object, you attach it to a sacrificial piece of wood. Now the way you attach this is you use, I'll just call, use the purple heart, you put a layer of glue on it, you put a layer of brown paper on it, all it is is just a grocery bag, you put another layer of glue on it, you put the piece of pine on it, you can see the paper sticking out of it. Be very careful that you remember to put the piece of paper in there because it's real easy to have two pieces of, of wood in front of you and I always use one of the little uh, acid brushes and I've got one floating somewhere uh, just to make sure that the glue goes in all the pores of the wood. Uh, and it's real easy if you got two pieces of wood in front of you to, to spread the glue around and forget that you're supposed to sandwich a piece of paper in it and glue them together. Um, what's, what's the reason for the paper, Steve? This is the centerpiece that was glued 
into this um, into this piece right here. You can see there's a film of paper still on the outside of both sides. Okay. When you're done turning this, you're going to use a chisel. And you're just going to sit it on the glue line and gently tap it and it should separate right on that piece of paper. <coughs> it should separate right on that piece of paper. <laughs> so you're left with the uh, you're left with the two purple heart halves or whatever wood you decide to do yeah. to use and you clean them up on a flat surface and then you glue them together. What, what's the inside of the urge made out of? Uh, that's just gold paint. Gold acrylic paint. Oh, okay. And what do you use for a finish? Uh, this was Krylon spray acrylic, but you can use whatever whatever you want. Okay. So, so it's once again it's a pretty straightforward process. Now the the only thing you need to keep in mind, you can somewhat vary the shape of that. But you're always, well, in this particular case, you're always going to start with a square spindle. Although you can, if you read the article, he talks about other things that you can do. But assuming you start with a square, the square spindle, if you put the, if you have this size of a sacrificial piece, you're going to get one shape. If your sacrificial piece is that big and the outside pieces are much thinner, you're going to get a different shape. So the sacrificial piece determines how, how wide or how thick you're going to make your double? Well, the three, the, three, the three pieces in and of themselves, yes. Okay. But you do want <coughs> this piece and this piece to be the same thickness. Because, because if they're not... And, and this is exaggerated, but let's say this outside piece is much thicker than this outside piece. Well, when you take this middle piece out, this edge is not going to marry up to that one. And you can't fix it with a belt You can try. <laughs> you can try. So, so the key is each of the outside pieces has to be the same size. But the inside piece can be any size you want. How do you locate the center for bonding it? Or how did you bond it? What I did, and that's a good question, because there are a couple of different ways you can do it, and there are probably a couple of different ways you shouldn't do it. <laughs> I think it's getting a little louder in the back. How's that? First of all, once you glue it up, it's hard, it's hard to find the center. Or I should say it's, it's reasonably, it's hard for me to find the center. So what I did is I started with the waist piece. And I, I made sure that both sides were coplanar. I mean, I've got a joiner and a planer. So even though this is a scrap piece of 2x6 uh, or 2x4 or whatever it is, it's not something you'd find on a job site and you just glue something to. I mean, it's, it's been milled. So I know that it's, it's uniform thickness. That's when I found my center on the scrap piece. And what I did, you can do it a couple of different ways. You can either use a pencil, which I don't have a whole lot of luck using pencils. Um, first of all, I can't find one in my shop. And secondly, when I do find it, it hasn't been sharpened in a long time. Uh, for something like this, what I'll typically use is a scribing knife. Uh, it gives you a real, and for, for two reasons. Number one, it gives you a very, very fine line. And secondly, and just as important, when you put your punch on it, if, you're, if, you're, if you've got a drawn line, my punch at least kind of wanders all around. Here, if you've got a scribed line, that punch just naturally gravitates. I mean, you can almost close your eyes to find the center. It gives you an excuse to use your scribing knife because you don't do flat work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you, even when you do that, sometimes you're off. 
but I, I figure I can I can use every advantage that I get. I mean, this this high tech tool costs a dollar ninety nine at Harbor Freight. So, well, what I do is corner to corner, and then where the cross in the middle. That, that's the only way I know how to do it. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there were other ways to do it. And I, and I guess I should point out, is even though there is an article with instructions, I've changed those instructions a little bit to fit how I do it. The fact that I do it this way doesn't mean that you've got to do it that way. It, it just kind of works out best for me. So I take this, the sacrificial piece. Well, actually, I, I start with that. Well, I guess I should explain this. I've only made one of these, so... Whenever I say I do this, I, I should have said I've done this once. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I started with the sacrificial piece, milled it so that the sides were coplanar, found the center, punched the center on each end. Uh, the two sides, yeah, I'm not sure if it's, if it's good sound, but we've got sound. Uh, the two sides, you then glue it temporarily glue it. Now I used the glue, paper, glue. You can also use double-sided carpet tape. And I've done that before for some inside out turning. What kind of glue do you use to put yours with? This, type bond two. Type bond two. J just like you're gluing up a piece of furniture. You glue it, you clamp it, you leave it overnight and you come back. If these sides aren't exactly square, doesn't matter because you've already squared the center, it'll just turn it off. It's, it's the center of the middle piece that's the important thing. So. Steve, when you used the paper, you didn't put any glue on the paper, did you? You just applied the glue to the Wood. surfaces? Wood, yes. <coughs> Most of the stuff that I turn, I like to start by turning between centers. Um, I'm not sure how else you would, uh, would do this anyway. You're not going to put it in a chuck. Uh, but I also like to use the center that fits inside the chuck uh, for a couple of reasons. And, and that's not an expensive tool. I think it costs 15 bucks. Uh, I think it's a Penn State tool. But you can clamp it right in your chuck. Uh, it saves a step. You don't have to put that in and then take it out and put your chuck in and, and do that. The other thing it does, it also automatically calibrates how big your tenon should be. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But we're going to start by roughing this down. So I lied, I've actually made one and a half of them. <laughs> now, you'll notice how it rocks. Doesn't matter. Because you're going to knock this center piece out and throw it away. You also notice, well, there's not a nub in the, there's a small nub in the center of that. Doesn't matter. <laughs> you're going to knock it out and throw it away. So there are some benefits. You don't have to fool around trying to get that nub out of the middle. Um, this, this nub on the end is real easy. In fact, in fact, you know, sometimes when you turn things, you're, you're being real careful and you're trying to catch it so it doesn't fall on the floor or whatever. This, you get to about an eighth of an inch and then you just break it off. Because you're going to throw it away. Doesn't matter. So, it, so there are some advantages to doing this. So we're going to start by making this round. Uh, you notice that I spin it before I turn it on. Before I turn it on, it's down at zero. You don't know who, you, who has used this before. Um, it could be wound up the, you know, full speed. You don't want it to start up that way. So you just, you just turn it up.
And this doesn't have to be perfectly round. You're just trying to knock the corners off. Uh, you know, you can still see some flats. We'll take the flats off, and then the next thing we're going to do is, is turn a tenon on the end. You notice when I'm turning, I'm not going back and forth with my hands. I've got the tool anchored against my body, and I'm just kind of leaning into it. And that's pretty round. Uh, some of you saw me just sticking that up there. If you hear the clanking, 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 you know it's not round, so you keep going. Uh, the alternative to that is stopping it every couple of seconds and looking at it and stopping it and looking at it and stopping and looking at it. And you can do that too. That works too, but it's just a, bit, a little annoying. Whenever I cut a tenon, I like to use a badan. You can use a, a parting tool. Uh, but the nice thing about a badan is I think it's about, it's either 5 sixteenths or 3 inches, 3 eighths of an inch thick, which is how thick or how long the tenon typically should be. That fits in most chucks. Uh, and from my vantage point, and you may be able to see it right up there, this chuck with the center in it is currently almost closed the whole way. So when you cut a tenon, obviously you need to cut it so that it fits in the chuck. It's really annoying when you cut a tenon and it's too big and you've got to put it back on and cut it again. It's even more annoying when you cut it and it's too small and it won't fit at all. So if you look at, if you look at that camera, I think, if I cut this tenon so that it is just a little bit bigger than the diameter of the outside of that, uh, that chuck jaw, it should fit just fine. At least that's what I'm hoping. Uh, you can use a, a go-no-go uh, go, no go gauge. I mean, you, you can do whatever. You can use calipers. You can do whatever works for you. But this, this seems to work fairly well. And obviously when you cut your tenon, you also need to know what kind of jaws you have on your chuck. Are you cutting a straight tenon? Are you cutting a detail, or you know, a dovetail tenon? Um, in this particular case, I'm cutting a, a straight tenon, so. If you lay a pencil on your, on your live center, it'll give you about a 49 millimeter circle. Now say that one more time. Take your pencil and lay it on the top of your live center, your live center, and then Turn it, scribe a, uh, a circle on the base, and that circle will be about 49 uh, millimeters, which is just about right. So if I'm cutting the tenon on this end, all I've got to do is remember. Hmm? Huh? Are you going to square their ends up first? Nah. As long as you've got enough length between the ends, and the reason, the, the, re the reason I'm not, I'm going to use this end to put in the chuck. The only thing in the chuck that's going to touch this wood is the stuff inside the hole and against the shoulder that I'm cutting. It really doesn't matter if the inside is rough or not. On this end, once I chuck it, I'm going to cut the top of that. That's when I'll square this out. I will eventually square this end, yes, but I'll wait until it's in the chuck. So. So that should fit. Hmm? The moment of truth. Do you think? Well, because you've already 
I got a gap, and you made it on the outside, you're going to put it on the inside. So. Hmm? That's going to go inside. But, right. but, but the chuck is already down. The chuck's already down. It's not expanded. Yeah. Chuck has almost closed the whole way. Almost. I mean, you got a, you know, that's perfect size right, right there. I could say, I could, say, I could be, uh, what's his face? You want to bet $10,000? <laughs> In which case, I'd hope you'd say no. <laughs> now, before I tighten it up, I will push this. I, just to make sure it's seated properly. You also kind of, you know, you can stand here and you can look where the jaw touches the, the body to see if there's any light showing on any of the jaws. There aren't. So it, uh, it's a tight fit. It's a Supernova 2. Technotool Supernova 2. Yeah, Rob came. <laughs> Rob, Rob came over and waxed it yesterday. So, <laughs> okay. After we've done that, we want to start shaping the outside. Uh, but uh, but Jimmy had a good idea. We should true this up a little bit. And this is one of the uh, few times that I will use a skew. But you can use whatever tool works best for you. And that's close enough because we're going to drill that out. I mean, this is all going to be removed. But we've got a nice flat end, a uniform end. Um, so we want it to look something like this. This is a simplified version of this. This I think I might be able to complete in the next hour. This I know I cannot complete in the next hour. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll look at this and then I'll tell you what additional steps you would need to get to here. This will show you the process though. Two halves glued together. This side and this side. Sorry. Not not the top and the bottom. Side by side. It's full length. Hmm? Okay. Full length. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the, the extra step that you have to do. This top is oval. This bottom is oval. The stem is round. Think about it. <laughs> this was the inside that came out of it. We'll talk about how you get from here to there. I think with this, I think, and we'll find out, I think when we split this and glue it back together, it'll be just fine and you won't have to do anything else to it, but once again, with my extensive experience, I can't really tell for sure, but we'll find out. All I'm doing right now is just putting this, um, the little, you can see on the top it's got a little bit of a curvature going in. I think, I personally I think that looks a little better than if it just goes out straight. But once again, that's just personal belief. Yeah. It's a spindle. Um, it's, it's running around 2200 RPMs. Um, you probably could go higher. I think if you run it, I, I find that my tools cut better if it's going fast. 
Now it's not a bowl. I mean, if, if it were a bowl or a big vase, it'd be quite different because then you're cutting cross grain. This is, this is spindle grain. I mean, it, it's, the dynamics are totally different. Uh, you know, if it was a bowl out to here, you wouldn't be running it at 2300 RPMs. Nowhere near there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this up here. And it's interesting, if you look at this wood, both of these are purple heart. One's purple and one's brown. And we just turned this. So it isn't like it's purple inside and brown on the outside. In fact, it was purple on the outside and brown on the inside. So don't assume that all purple heart is purple. Or even if it's purple, it's going to stay purple. Hmm? So this mark is kind of, kind of, sort of, the bottom of this. That could, but that could change. Remember, when you're done, nobody's going to know where that bottom was to start with. So if it's a little taller, that's okay. If it's a little shorter, that's okay too. So don't, don't get obsessed with saying we've got to hit that right away. Uh, and you'll see I also have a lot of wood to spare with this. Personally, just from a comfort standpoint or a safety standpoint, I don't like to get my tools too close to this thing. Uh, I've s well, I've, <laughs> I've seen some people, one of them in this audience, who when he turns finials or caps, I think he actually sticks the tool inside the chuck jaws to try to squeeze that last piece of wood out of it. I can't do that. A challenge, yeah. If you ride the bevel on the jaws, it doesn't disturb the edge. It would disturb me, though. <laughs> <laughs> You could, you could. Now one thing you need to be careful of, as you turn this, look at where the purple is compared to the white. When you're done, that white's not going to be there anymore. So you can't turn through the purple or you're going to have two halves, a top half. You're going to have four halves. Instead of two halves side by side, you're going to have a top and a bottom with nothing but air between them. So make sure you don't turn this so thin that you go through the purple piece. I mean, you, believe me, you can do that. Uh, it's it's kind of like one of those, oh geez, what have I done? Um, I haven't done it yet, but it's, it, it, could, it could easily be done. Then you wouldn't have a foot. Then you'd have a ring and a ring. <laughs> so. so, I mean, really, when you look at this, that may be about as thick as you, or I should say, as thin as you want that to be. And whereas I can go back about this far with the roughing gouge, I really don't want to go any further than that. So you can switch over to a spindle gouge. Well, actually, for any of this, you can do whatever tool works best for you. If it's a, if it's a skew, it's a skew. If it's a spindle gouge, it's a spindle gouge. If it's a bowl gouge, you know, whatever works best for you. So. I just happen to like to use a spindle gouge, but once again, whatever tool you use is, is fine as long as it gets the job done.
my objective is to someday to be able to turn something like this without using any sandpaper. And I haven't gotten there yet. Hmm? Well, it does. We'll try this. I am. I gotta get a little closer, I think. Get a bowl gown. That is a bowl gown. It's a quarter inch bowl gown. Get a bigger bigger one. <laughs> well, I don't have a I don't have a bigger one with me, that's the problem. You do it good. Now one thing to remember, anytime you part something off, and you can see we're not, we're almost through the purple heart, we're not quite through it yet, but anytime you part off a bowl or a vase or a goblet, you always want that little concave so that when it sits, it's not, it's not rocking like that. Well, with this, If the purple heart is concave, that's all that it's all that matters. It's all that matters. Which is why it doesn't matter that this nub is stuck out on the end, because that's going to be sliced away. I mean, well, the whole middle piece is going to be sliced away. So once you get through the purple heart, and it's concaved, you can just go for broke. I mean, you can do the rest with a badan or a parting tool or, or whatever you want. You can use a saw for that matter, uh, but just, just snap it off. Um, why should you? Why not? Why part it off? Well, you have to go, you have to part through the purple heart. But well, you raise a real good question. Assuming you part through the purple heart, do you even have to go the rest of the way? You wouldn't have to. Well, I, I except except I would say except I would say yeah. If if you go through the purple heart and you don't part it off, when I split this one, I thought it would be best if I started from the bottom, thinking that if I screwed it up with the chisel edge, I could hide it on the bottom. If you don't part this off here, and you start at the bottom, you're gonna part this piece away and these pieces are going to still be stuck to it. You conceivably then could go deeper down with your chisel and part it off again. But yeah, it wouldn't, you wouldn't gain your jam choke. No. Yeah. Hmm? That spoils your jam choke. Well you don't need a jam choke. You may someday. You may. You may. Well, well not all that extra material. So we're going to split this off and see what happens. So this may be the first turning demo that you've seen where the person brought a hammer. So all we're going to do, and I like to put the flat side of the chisel. A board? Oh, you were talking about the chisel? Okay, how's this? Well, this is probably better. That, that way is only about this wide anyway. So let's see what happens here. Not too bad. That's one down and one to go. You see any nub in the bottom? <laughs> you see any bump at the bottom? It's all in the pine. So let's try one more. I really 
want to mop my floor tonight, but I'm going to have to come over and try this. <laughs> So the next step, okay, that's basically what it's going to look like when you're done. Before you glue that, remember what happened when you glued it and there was paper in there. It came apart. So somehow you got to get rid of this paper. I mean, there's still paper on this wood. You don't want to glue paper to paper. And I'll tell you one thing you definitely do not want to do is you don't want to take a piece of sandpaper and try to sand it like this. It will not be flat, I guarantee you. This proves that it will not be flat. I don't know what grit to start with. I'm going to start with... Uh, is there any kind of chemical that you can take it off? Maybe. If there is, let me know. Yeah, that's why I, I, I think sandpaper on a flat surface is the way we want to go. Hmm? Well, when you say a sanding station, what do you mean? Well, well, recommend. I mean, recognize we don't have we don't have a whole lot that we have to sand off. I mean, I mean this, you know, couple passes like this. We're already scraping some of the paper off. I mean, I like the I like the question: Is there a chemical or something? I I don't know. If there is, I don't know what it is. And I guess I should, there may be someone somewhere that thinks they can shorten this step by not putting as much glue on it to glue it together. Don't do that. I mean, the last thing you wanted to do is to come apart while you're turning it. There's still a little bit of, of paper on there, but when you glue it together, No, and, and, and when you do, you'll also see there are little, I don't know if you can see that against the white background, a little imperfection where it doesn't line up exactly at the bottom. That's why you got sandpaper. Just clean it up. If you have to go the whole way up the side to clean it up, you can do that. that that's exactly right. The center wasn't exactly the center. You're right, that's what caused that. If you're doing something like this, where you don't want the whole thing to be oval, you want part of it to be round, what we did with this, uh, yeah, right there. But when I took it off the lathe, the center part was this big. And you got to get from there to there. Well, you split that one, the whole thing. You didn't cut it off, did you? Um, you're right. I, I made sure that I was through the purple heart. Yep. Well, I know what happened. I was through the purple heart and I think this piece fell off. <laughs> I, think, I think when I parted it off, this piece fell off. The purple heart piece. The purple heart piece, yeah. That was, that was good. Yeah. I planned it that way. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Either advertently or inadvertently. So what we did with... Um, this
once again, you start... Is that a Beale buff shaft? That is a Beale buff shaft, yes. You start with something like this, and you actually do this step before you part it. You gotta remember, this fits in there like that. This comes down to keep it from rattling around. Although I don't think I had this, uh, I don't think I had this tip on it. I think I had a different tip on it. I got a smaller tip. You bring the tail stock up, and then you center it. You turn it round. Actually, actually, this was gone. This was this would have had to have been gone. We actually put this. Yeah, that's how it fit. This. That's right. After it was glued back together, when I put it in here, this stem looked like that. So then I had to turn. I had tailstock up against it and turned it round. Well, I mean, you you got to take light cuts with a sharp tool, and then when you get to the transition points, yeah, what do you do there? well, you do one of two things. If it's a big if it's a big transition, <coughs> use a rasp or a file. I mean, I mean, you got to remember, you're going from a circle to an oval. Yeah. I mean that fits in there. And then you sand it, and you start at basically 150 or 100, 150, 220. And work. Yeah, exactly. Now the one thing that I I did learn is if you look at the if you look at the bottom, it truly does transition from a round to an oval. If you look at the top, the transition is not nearly as continuous, and I think it looks just as good there. So if I had it to do over again. I think I'd probably have, may, I may have the bottom transition just like the top did, because there's a lot less handwork required to do that. Any questions on this whole thing? I mean, it's really, I mean, what were we here, uh, you know, maybe an hour, hour and a half? Uh, now, my turning skills are no better than anybody else in this room. I mean, and, and some of you guys have a lot better turning skills than I do. Uh, pass that thing this? Mm -hmm. I tell you one thing, nobody in the room has made one of these, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the only reason the only reason I made it is because I read the article in the in the magazine. But I mean, all you all you. Hmm. You always got to make one. Well, you do just to see what it's like. Um, but I mean, all you're doing is gluing up a block and turning it around, and well, you saw how easy. Now I can say after. Two attempts, it does seem to split fairly easily. You know, the first time I tried it, I thought, oh man, the bottom's going to split and the top's going to snap off. Um, but even with that long stem on it, it split right down the middle. No problems. I suppose if you didn't have the paper in there, it might split differently. Oh, absolutely. That's why I said, don't forget to put the paper in there. Now, I will tell you, I've done some inside out turning before and I used double sided carpet tape. That was a whole lot more difficult taking the wood apart than this. Yeah. And I mean, I was concerned about using the glue and the paper instead of the double-sided tape, thinking it might not be substantial enough. But I mean, you can see I've rattled and rolled in, on the inside a couple of times, and it didn't, it didn't come apart. So if you want to use double-sided tape, you can, but be prepared to encounter a lot more resistance when you try to split the pieces apart. I mean, the first time I did this, or, or did the inside out turning, I used a double-sided carpet tape, and then I put mass, or, uh, packing tape around both ends of it to keep the, keep the thing together. But I think, I think the glue and the, and the craft paper works just fine. I used to use that before I bought a chuck. I just had face plates and, and the paper and glue. 
for quite a few yeah. quite a few times. And that came apart better than yeah. Bob was asking what this is. This is an old deal buffing mandrel. Uh, you know, I bought the old three-in-one shaft, three, three wheels on one, and I really didn't like it. The wheels were too close together, so I replaced it with the, uh, the individual buff pads, and I was just about ready to get rid of this, and uh, I saw it in this article, and I said, well, I'll give this a try, and it's, it works out great. You can use this really for a hollow form that's, that's this deep if you want to. And if the mouth is bigger than this, you just make a bigger... I mean, all this is is just a donut with a hole in the middle. When you're using it, you had a pad on the end? Yes. Okay, so your load is on that <coughs> pad, not your centering cover. Absolutely, absolutely. Nobody's talking about would it tend to split. No, no. It's all, just a positioning device. All this is, and that, I'm glad you brought that up. If you're, if you're jamming a bowl, you got a lot of meat to jam it against. If you're jamming a hollow form, or a goblet that has a tiny stem on it, you're not going to jam from the end to the headstock. You're going to jam from, um, yeah, the, the bottom, well, really between the tailstock and the bottom. So you'd put it in, put the tailstock in, then you'd move that up to the work. There, now you're putting the tailstock in, it's tight. And then you'd move that up to Stabilize it. And all that does is keep it. If I didn't have that, it would. All this does is just. Yeah, there. And this is just a. This has an. I don't have the Allen wrench with me that, that fits this, but this just slides up and holds that in place. That's all it does. Yeah, this is. Your, your, your weight bearing surface is the bottom of this, not the top. Because if you start. If you, do, if you did that, there's a good chance you would split the top of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think mine was too, so I don't know. So I don't know. So I know I know some of you want to go catch the debate, or you got other things to do. But uh, well, no, seriously, I mean several. Me, they want to go see the debate. Uh, oh, and then and we're recording it as well. So uh, uh, we'll call it a night, and if you have any questions, come on up and let me know.